Okay, so what we're going to look at today is how to create uh, PowerBuilder components that can be used by Visual Studio developers. And specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, how to create uh, visual components, including visual components that use uh, the data window. So, uh, first thing we'll do is we'll get out the PowerBuilder.net uh, IDE and we will select um, new target, .NET assembly. Uh, we're just going to accept the defaults here until it gets to this point. Um, now previous versions of PowerBuilder, what we would see here would be non-visual object, uh, custom non-visual object, and maybe some non-visual object classes. Uh, what's new here is this option to create a custom visual object. So we'll go ahead and select that. And what's going to open up is a, a WPF window um, that we can then start populating with visual controls uh, uh, from PowerBuilder. So, for example, I could drop a command button on here and uh, go ahead and, and script it up and uh, uh, at that point uh, compile it and uh, using my project options I would, I would indicate you know, that I'm going to expose this visual control. In fact, I've got one that I've already, I've already created and so we'll go take a look at that one. Um, right here. Uh, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's just a command button. It says hello on it. And when you click on the command button, it says hello world. And and not that that's something you would actually create and hand off to a Visual Studio developer. They could do that easily enough in, in Visual Studio. But just kind of a form a basis of of you know just seeing a quick and dirty way of how to do this. Um, and then once we figured out you know how you do that, then we'll step it up a bit. We'll 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 actually inc include a uh, data window control and look at to see how we could really do more production level stuff. But let's work with this basic sample for now. So we've got our uh, our simple user object, just command button. Uh, what we're going, doing is going in here and notice that I've renamed the control uh, other than something other than you custom visual. So uh, it makes sense when, when the, when the, when the uh, Visual Studio developer gets it. Uh, when I compile that, what I'm going to get is not only an, an assembly that has my um, visual control in it. Uh, sorry, wrong one. There's the assembly, but it's going to be a series of uh, .NET assemblies. Um, you know, the PowerBuilder runtime.NET assemblies as well. And so what you'll do is you package all this up, you'll hand it off to your Visual Studio developer. And to simulate a Visual Studio developer, what I have is I have Visual Studio. This is the uh, um, Visual Studio 2010 Express, which you can just go and download yourself from, uh, from Microsoft for free if you would like to, like to experiment with it yourself. Um, that and it's on a, we're, it's running under under a virtual machine and the reason I did that is so there's no smoke and mirrors going on here there's no power builder deploy on this virtual machine the only thing on here is Visual Studio plus these libraries that I've brought over uh, which are just the runtime de uh, assemblies and the uh, the assembly that contains the visual object so what I would do then is I go ahead and say I'm going to create a new project. I would say I'm going to create a WPF application, and so I get this blank uh, WPF application that opens up. Um, what I'm going to do so that I can uh, actually drop stuff uh, on the window that hasn't bothered to appear yet, oh there it is, okay. Um, There it is. Yeah, the, the things opened up a little bit uh, for a very wide screen, so that's why it wasn't showing up. I'm going to go into the toolbox, and what I did is, I, in the toolbox, what I did is I created a new um, a tab right here, and I called it Power Builder WPF Controls. And then I went in there and I said, um, choose items, and use the browse feature to go in and browse for the um, the, this is the the, dot net, the the assembly we were just looking at right there. And then I've got another one we're going to look at here in a bit where I've actually got a data window embedded. So I, I just referenced that and that added it to my toolbox here. So now I can take that visual object that I created in PowerBuilder 
and drop it into the WPF window there in Visual Studio. Um, when you go, if you know, I'm, I'm hoping you'll go out and try this uh, yourself. What you'll find is you're going to get a couple errors when you first do this. Um, so we'll go ahead and run, try to run this. We'll save it. I'll try to run it, and so you'll see the errors happening here, and you're going to see what I what I'm going to do to to, to address um, what needs to be done to to correct them. Okay. Oh, yeah, the error is way over here. Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to run it. I've got some errors here. Let's go take a look. Um, and one of the errors here is it's telling me that um, system web isn't accessible. And the reason system web is not accessible is because when I went in and into Visual Studio and just said I want a, a WPF application, it picked a particular set of libraries from the framework and and made those available. They called it the .NET Framework 4.0. Uh, for client profile. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to change this just to .NET Framework 4. And it's going to tell me it has to reload. That's fine. Okay, so that's going to address one of the problems. Uh, the other problem is it's going to tell me is that it can't find Sybase.PowerBuilder.WPF controls. And, the, and the, what this error is telling me is that remember I you know we looked at all those runtime assemblies well, the only runtime assembly, the only assembly I actually referenced here explicitly was the one that contains my, my uh, visual object. What it's, this is telling me is that this one assembly I actually have to add in as a reference. So I'll say add reference. I will add that reference into this project and now it's got a clean compile. And so I can go ahead and run this now and hit the button and sure enough like off the side of the screen because once again it's this thing's like super wide there we go hello world okay so that's a really simple demo of creating a power builder component and using it in visual studio and it's not not necessarily realistic uh, we got we're gonna be wanting to do something more than just uh, you know using a command button we're gonna use uh, you know what we really like Power Builder for is the data window, and so we want to create a, um, a custom visual object here that actually uses a data window, and that's what I've done here. And uh, you know, to kind of show that this is real life. What I've got here is actually a data window that references the the uh, sample emp uh, table uh, that, that you get with uh, an Oracle deploy. This is actually going to connect to an Oracle database and retrieve the employee records from that that sample database. So I've got a, a grid data window that retrieves the uh, the data. Uh, in my custom user object, uh, not only do I have the data window, but I've got command button. All that command button does is does retrieve on the data window. Oops. And I've got a, a little scroller controller here. Um, and what I'm also going to be doing is I'm actually just to just to look at some of the different ways that you can get, actually get connected to the database um, and and uh, try to try to share information back and forth between the Visual Studio and the uh, and the PowerBuilder component is actually created methods on this user object. Uh, there's three of them that have different ways of us connect, actually establishing the connection to the Oracle database. Um, the simplest one is where we're going to let PowerBuilder do all the work. So the PowerBuilder either you know either hard coded like I've done here in this in in this example, or maybe through a config file for the PowerBuilder component. Uh, you'll have the database connection information, and Visual Studio won't tell PowerBuilder how to do the connect. It will just rely on PowerBuilder to handle it all on its own. So then you would just populate SQL CA like the way you normally would. You uh, connect to the database, you do your set trans object, and we're done. Okay, so that might be one way you might want to do it. I I don't typically think that would happen. I would, I'm thinking that the Visual Studio application might also be doing work with that that Oracle database and that you wouldn't necessarily want to have two different configuration files with the information. So you might have a configuration file or maybe a hard-coded into your Visual Studio app, the connection information. And when it goes to use the PowerBuilder component, it might want to pass that in. So here's the second method where I've, uh, I'm actually passing in the information. I've created a method that allows me to allows the Visual Studio developer to pass in the data source, the user ID and password that we're going to use. And so uh, the Visual Studio now is more control. It's going it, to it might have do its work with the database, but then it's going to pass in the connection information to Power Builder, and then Power Builder will use that to make the connection to the database and, and do its work. 
uh, that's a little more realistic, but but probably not entirely realistic. What's probably more realistic even than that is this last method, uh, and and we'll get into this when we get into the Visual Studio side. But what ha what happens is we're going to create a proxy object. That proxy object is going to contain a reference to the connection and the transaction that was established in Visual Studio. That gets passed into us, and so Power Builder no longer is actually initializing a connection to the database. It's just going to use the connection the Visual Studio already created and passed into us using the set ADO connection method on SQL CA. So at that point, uh, when you when you do that, SQL CA then just uses the Visual Studio transaction and connection. Uh, and then we do when we do the set trans object, SQL A C A is basically acting, acting as proxy within Power Builder component to point back to the Visual Studio transaction. So that's the that's the third method we're going to look at. So we go back to our our uh, project for this one. You'll notice because I have methods on this Visual Stu component, I'm going to actually choose those methods. See if I just if I just selected this, it would just deploy the the control, but it wouldn't expose the methods. I want the methods exposed, and so I'm selected those. I've also renamed the control and the and the uh, the methods to make them more Visual Studio friendly. At that point, we compile this. We get a set of runtime DLL, uh, well, runtime assemblies actually. We hand those off to the Visual Studio developer. Now, one thing we'll have to do is uh, when when Power Builder compiled that that um, that is this Visual User object. It's going to give me this set of of um, assemblies along with that component and say, here, go deploy that. Uh, because we're creating an ADO.NET connection, uh, just like you would with a Parabler application, you've got some database assemblies you're going to have to deploy as well, and that's what this set is. And so you're going to have to add those to these and give those to the uh, Visual Studio developer as well. And finally, uh, Parabler uses um, this tool, this uh, Antler 3, uh, in order to read in SRD files. And so you're going to have to deploy that as well. So this would, you know, when you're referencing a data, if you're not referencing a data window, you deploy this. If you're referencing a data window in your custom user object, you're going to reference that plus these as well. We go back over to uh, Visual Studio, and uh, let's go ahead and open one that's already already been created. So here's the WPF application I've created that I've dropped in the uh, the data window control on. Um, in addition, to, uh, the, uh, I've created uh, some command buttons that reference those those three methods. Um, in here in the references, you know, notice I mentioned earlier you had to uh, you had to include the WPF controls. Um, when you're using a data window, you also have to reference uh, the Antler three directly. And in order for us to pass in that that connect the Visual Studio connection object, we're going to have to reference this data source sharing uh, assembly as well. And I'm going to go ahead and look in the code in this command button. That's probably the one of most interest to us. Is what we're going to do? Uh, we're going to you're going to go ahead and create our connection to the database using Visual Studio and open it up and and initialize a transaction. Now here's how we get it over to Power Builder. We create this uh, this this um, this object, this proxy object, based on the I ADO connection proxy interface, and then we go ahead and create it uh, using uh, as, as class ADO connection proxy. Uh, at that point, we take the connection and transaction that we created in Visual Studio, assign them to the connection and transaction. Um, variables in this proxy object and then pass those in on that method I created earlier. Uh, so we can go ahead and run that. Okay. And uh, the assigned connection and what happened there. It's probably off the side of the screen here. Yeah, I've got a little return code that says one. Just tells me know that that you know the connection that I created in Visual Studio did get over to Power Builder. Power Builder was happy with it and when I do retrieve, boom, there's the data. Um, so that's that's basically it. That's how we, you can create um, components in uh, Power Builder, Visual Components Power Builder, including data window objects, and uh, make them available to Visual Studio developers.